if you're going in order, it's just like, whoa, hello. That's a lot of banjo there, buddy. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Taste Like Music. Jason and Joe here. Cramser's got the week off. Uh, if you're new to the channel, normally there are three of us here. Uh, we cover a different band every single week. On Tuesday, we rank all of the studio albums of that artist. On Wednesday, we give you our top 10 favorite songs by that same artist. And on Thursday, we have a third discussion video based on that artist. If that sounds like the kind of content you're into, be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notification. Uh, while you're at it, you might as well hit like on this video. Uh, and this week we are getting into some Gene Clark, uh, one of Joe's obsessions of late, so the past year or so at least I'd say. I've uh, been hearing a lot about Gene on different uh, songs of the year lists and obscure song list video that we just did with Michael Ralt. Uh, you had a song pop up there. So we know you're a big fan. We did the birds because of your uh, fandom or, or maybe those are two are somehow linked your love of the birds and Gene, I'm sure. For me though, much less familiar with Gene Clark. I really only know a little bit and most of that is because of you. Uh, you had um, For a Spanish Guitar, I think on one of your lists. So I knew that song. I had checked out a little bit of No Other, hadn't listened to it in full yet. So mostly new for me. Uh, going into the week. Uh, there are seven studio albums that we are counting. We're basing it mostly off of like his Wikipedia and what is counted as officially his discography. The uh, There's other stuff like the Dillard and Clark stuff uh, that seems to be like its own thing. We're going to keep that a little separate. Maybe we'll touch on that some other day. So, but we got seven to talk about today. You want to talk a little bit about how you got into Gene and how much of this you knew before this week? Yeah. Um... I've been loving Gene for about a year now, kind of on a quixotic uh, quest to make Gene Clark known to the rest of the world. Um, because, I mean, if you haven't heard like the Gene Clark solo records, like what hope does normal everyday people have? Um, so I have been uh, over the last year or so trying to work in as much Gene Clark into daily conversations and on videos here. So I hope this video continues that. It's weird because I came across, there's five people to thank for me learning about Gene Clark's solo uh, career. I knew about his bird stuff, but I never really thought to like get into his solo stuff because you just never hear anyone talk about it. And you never really, I mean, you don't hear it on the radio, God, never. And even all my dealings with like the country rock stuff, uh, sweetheart of the rodeo and and all that stuff that I was into like Spotify never played me a Gene Clark solo song once so I don't know and now that he seems to be popping up um, all over the place fortunately but to credit my Gene Clark discovery it all happened because of recommendations and Brian Bringleson recommended Magnetic South to Cramser which obviously was a horrible mistake because Cramser hates anything to do with country that's why he's not here today. Um, but I thought it sounded interesting. I threw it on. I liked it. After it was over, uh, Spotify always like throws you into a radio playlist, basically, you know, based on what you're listening to. And one of the first songs was a uh, Gene Clark number. And I think I remember what it was. It was something from Gene Clark with the Gazin Brothers. Uh, I think it was maybe I think I'm gonna feel better. And I, I heard it, I was like, okay, who, you know, what is this? So I started listening to the whole album, really liked it, jumped over to No Other, and I've basically been obsessed ever since. I probably listened to No Other a hundred times in the past year. I'm not exaggerating at all. I've listened to it three or four times a day when I first heard it. So I'm, uh, yeah, you could say I'm a big Gene Clark fan, and I'm really... Looking forward to doing this, and I'm glad Cramsey's not here to throw water on the parade. I don't know how it would even be possible to listen to one record a hundred times in a year <laughs> with with all of our other listening. So that is uh, that is something. Uh, I guess we'll get into it. Seven to uh, count down. I guess I'll go first. Uh, I'm gonna go at the bottom for me. 
uh so rebellious a lover uh from 1987 this seems to be the record that finally helped revive his career a bit um it was fairly well reviewed moderately successful i suppose uh at least compared to what the expectations were the problem for me personally is that I just don't think Carla Olson's very much of a singer, and I think she steps all over some of Gene's performances on this. Uh, the Drifter, especially, it seems like opening the record, it's like trying to introduce Carla and Gene as equals, both singing like half the song and like singing at the same time and coming in. And it's just, I don't know, it seems very clunky to me one of those duets that just the voices don't mesh together well and they just kind of fight each other through the whole song. The next track, Gypsy Rider, is great though. Uh, I think it's one of uh, Gene Clark's uh, best. Uh, Carla Hangs Back, just mostly singing harmony on that one. It works a lot better. Uh, I think Delgado is pretty great. Uh, Fair and Tender Ladies, also a strong tune. Uh, they do Hot Burrito Number 1 from the Flying Burrito Brothers, which... I don't think it touches the Burrito Brothers version, which I think is immaculate, but uh, it's such a great song that I think it's still a welcome addition to the record. It closes, though, uh, kind of weak with uh, the uh, Carla Olsen penned Are We Still Making Love, which is a really re weird title for a song, uh, first of all. And then you get uh, Why Did You Leave Me Today, uh, which is probably Gene's weakest contribution on the record. And then you get a, a Joe South tune uh, don't it make you want to go home, which is okay, but it, it's kind of like the drifter where they're singing over each other a lot on it. Um, so that one doesn't work. And it's kind of like, I don't know, three songs at the end that don't, don't do too much for me. I think it's still okay. There's some good stuff on it. Some of the, some of the gene tunes like gypsy rider are, are pretty solid. Uh, just not as good as some of the other efforts in his discography, kind of ironic that the one that finally gets him some attention is the worst one. Uh, but three stars for me. Still not a not a bad record at all. Uh, that's good. That's solid. It's a good floor for Gene. Three stars. No problems there. My number seven, however, is going to be Firebird, which this is Gene in the 80s. So you get a little of that 80s sounding country on songs like Rodeo Rider, the 80s production on Rain Song. Um, Blue Raven has like this really AM gold flute on it. it. None of these, I don't think these songs are bad. I like pretty much all the songs on here, but I've got a pretty high expectations for Gene in general. Um, he opens with Mr. Tambourine Man, which obviously the birds did. That was their big song. I don't mind this one. It, it's updated for the 80s. It sounds pretty good. I think it has all of Bob Dylan's verses in it, so it's longer. And Gene sounds good. Like, there's not much degradation in his voice. Something About You, Baby, is you kind of start to lose Gene a little bit in the mix here. His vocals don't really rise above the, the backing ones. And it's, you know, it's kind of a 70s gold, maybe a little too 80s sounding pop tune. Uh, Rain Song's nice. Vanessa's nice. If you read my mind, his Gordon Lightfoot cover, pretty darn solid. He does a cover of his own song again with Feel a Whole Lot Better, which he wrote on, from the um, Mr. Tamarine Man album. So the, the two updates kind of feel unnecessary, but they're, they're not bad songs. But this, just one, this one just isn't that interesting to me after everything else. Uh, and the songwriting's a little worse. It's it's okay, um, but the the '80s Gene doesn't quite work as much as the classic '70s Gene. And uh, I think it's just good. I have it at 3.5 stars, but it's one where I'm more likely just kind of pick and choose a song or two instead of just going straight through. So it's really the only one I feel like I'm not gonna just go back to and listen all the way through again. So. Three and a half stars, but it, it gets better for Gene. All right. Yeah, that's my number six, Firebird from 1984, I think. I saw a couple different dates online. There's like a hundred different album, album covers. Every streaming service and every publication that wrote a review on it uses a different album cover, and they're all terrible. 
Um, I don't know. It definitely has the eighties production. Like you were talking about when I first hit play on this and I heard that piano at the beginning and the sound they were using, I was like, Oh, this is going to be a bad one. Uh, but it's actually not as bad as that initial sound led me to believe it would be. I think he kind of settles into it. It's all right. Not, not too bad uh, production wise. I don't really like him doing the birds covers, but I understand why, like his, his career was kind of on life support at this point. And he's really just trying to like connect to the past and like, remember why you like me? Like I'm the guy from the birds. Here it is. I'll put it in the album title. Don't forget. I'm the guy from the birds. Like he's really trying to just like grasp at straws and, and do whatever he can to get uh, people to listen to him. So I get it. And, and the covers of those bird songs aren't bad at all. They're, they're decent. But like you said, for someone who's really interested in Gene Clark, they are probably more interested in hearing, hearing some new songs. He also covers Gordon Lightfoot on this record. If, uh, if you could read my mind, uh, that's pretty decent. There's a lot of really good like Eagle-esque harmonies on this record. Herb Peterson, Andy Candanes, Chris Hillman, and TJK uh, all sing uh, harmonies on this record. And I think the harmonies sound really, really good on, on most of the record. I think most of the songs, like I said, are actually good enough to rise above the, the kind of lame sounding pro production that's trying to drag them down. Made for Love, I think is a great song, has an excellent melody. Uh, some of the songs you mentioned, Rain Song uh, is really good. Rodeo Rider, I like a lot. To me, Vanessa is the one that kind of crumbles under the weight of the production. Uh, probably the worst song to date on a Gene Clark record. This record was well-reviewed, actually, but had like uh, distribution issues where they, I don't know, just like another thing. Finally, he gets a, a record with some decent reviews and uh, something else goes wrong. Uh, I don't know. The eighties were a tough time for this type of music. I think it, it's an admirable effort. Like I said, at reconnecting with the past while still trying to figure out how to forge ahead. It just doesn't quite fully connect the dots for me. Some okay songs, some not great production. It's just kind of, I don't know, a mixed bag. And like you said, probably a record where I would come back to individual tracks, but not going to listen to it start to finish very often. I don't think so. Uh, three stars again for me for Firebird. All right, I'm going to go with the So Rebellious a Lover. So we're pretty much in sync so far. I like it more than you, though. I really think the production and the way the guitars sound and everything is very good for the 80s. Like, it reminds me more of, uh, like, a Dwight Yoakam sound than Firebird, which really gets into, like, the cheesier aspects of the 80s. I think so. Really, so Lover really plays it well with the way everything sounds. I think the guitars sound great. I like Carla Olson's vocals. It took me a little while to warm up to them. I had this one at the bottom for a while, but kind of been getting more into it lately this week when I've been listening to it more. I think Gene sounds great on this. I think his songs, again, and I'll touch on this basically on every record he does too many covers and there's a bunch of bonus tracks that easily could have replaced some of the the covers the joe south cover maybe i mean the the bonus tracks on the reissue uh day for night jokers are wild which is a cover but winning hand lovers turn around i think are really solid on the actual album i think the drifter is pretty good i like it i like the way they trade off and I, I think he sounds, you know, he's getting up there in age. He's obviously had a lot of drugs by this point. Um, but I think his vocals still have that ragged, earthy, you know, almost country western sound to them. And I think it mixes interestingly with, with Olsen. She's a very, like, modern singer. Uh, but I think they work together pretty well. I do like Gypsy Rider a lot. It's probably the best on the album. Uh, I think the lyrics are really good, real soul searching he does. And, um, you know, his, his lyrics are almost never a problem. You know, they're usually really good. Always enjoy his lyrics, his singing. Usually, you know, I like Delgado a lot. Every Angel in Heaven, which was written by Carl Olson is okay. There's a Woody Guthrie. And Martin Hoffman tune, Deportee, playing Racket Los Gatos, decent, um, but I like the Gene Clark ones better. 
Uh, Fair and Tender Ladies is a reworking of a traditional song. I think it's really good. It sounds great. Uh, strong melody. All on Saturday Night, it's a pretty good cover of a John Fogarty. The Hot Burrito number one is decent, but it's not as good as some of the tracks they left off. I, I heard people talking about this as like the first Americana album, which I don't know if I buy that, but it, it does have that kind of Americana sound to it. It's kind of like a intro to what Alison Krauss and Robert Plant did uh, on their couple of successful collaborations. This one a little more country. Um, and I don't know, I, I think Olsen on a bunch of tracks sounds good. I, she sounds a little bit like a country fried version of like Chrissy Hine to me, which I like. Um, and there's some cool stuff. The jazz shuffle of Every Angel in, Huff, uh, in Heaven is good. I would have I would have thought Delgado was a cover tune, but it is a, a Gene Clark. Uh, but it really feels like like a classic 50s you know, country tune, Roy Rogers or something. And uh, I think it's it's solid. Uh, I give it four stars. It's a nice, you know, coda on his career. Do I wish it was just Gene Clark and no Carla Olson? Maybe, uh, but you know that, that's kind of what you have to deal with with Gene Clark. A lot of covers, and um, you know, Carla Olson kind of sticking her head in. Where it'd be nice if she was just a backup vocalist. Maybe I think would probably be a little more successful. A la like Emmy Lou Harris and uh, somebody like that, but I think it's a it's a good combo. So I, I give it four stars. I like it. All right, my number five is uh, the record right before those two. I've got two sides to every story from 1977, uh, produced by Thomas Jefferson K, the same person who produced No Other. They work together a lot. Um, and like I said, same producer as no other. So it's shocking when it comes out of the gate with such a different sound. It is like night and day. They recorded this one on their own with no label because no other cost so much. They spent so much making it and then it did absolutely nothing. So uh, they, they were on their own here. But Home Run King comes out of the gate with that rolling banjo played by Doug Dillard. You've got banjo and fiddle on In the Pines a lot more of like a down home intimate type of sound way more country influence coming through where you had uh, much more of like a, a fuller lusher uh, more ornate baroque psychedelic whatever you want to call it on no other this is way more stripped back i don't think the that the songwriting is as consistently strong here but I do think there are some amazing songs and i think the record's a little backloaded actually uh, Sister Moon, incredible track, uh, just gorgeous. Some of his uh, best, most delicate singing. Uh, the keys on it are great, played by Mike Utley. Past Addresses, I think, is a really beautiful song, too. Uh, Silent Crusades, a really pretty closer. His voice on it is is really kind of worn sounding, but still really emotional and you know really delivers the song well. Beautiful organ on that track as well. I, I think pretty much with every Gene Clark album there's there's at least a couple really really great songs this one is no different like some of the stuff near the beginning of the record though it didn't really connect with me that much like home run king the opening track mm, didn't didn't do a lot for me but yeah some of those tracks near the end uh especially sister moon and uh, past addresses i thought were fantastic songs um so those will definitely be worth going back to pretty good record i'm going three and a half stars for this one all right that is also my number five and yeah it, it is a tale of two sides two sides to every story very prescient there side one again you're you're just overloading a little bit with uh covers reworkings of his old songs you know in in the pines is the traditional uh traditional tune arranged here and it's a little too peppy for me for the subject matter uh kansas city southern is a song he did with uh, Dillard on the Dillard and Clark records, Give My Love to Marie, James Talley cover. So you're kicking on the, the first side with three covers. Home Run King, uh, I like, it is very like weird listening to it, especially if you listen to it after like no other, if you're going in order, it's just like, whoa, hello. That's a lot of banjo there, buddy. Um, 
but you know, I kind of like the countryness of this one. Uh, Lonely Saturday, I think, is a solid, you know, classic, you know, out of love song um, from Gene. Good lyrics. I do like Kansas City Southern. Jeff Baxter from Steely Dan plays on it, and I don't know exactly what songs he plays on, but he's definitely on that one. Uh, really cool solo on it. Uh, and you kind of, I did get some hints of Steely Dan on like Home Run King, like if Steely Dan played country, maybe it'd sound like that. Um, but the second half is really where it comes alive. Sister Moon is awesome. Uh, that big lush production that Thomas Jefferson K brought to no other kind of shows its face there. Uh, Mary Lou's a cover, but it, it's got a, a nice hard, uh, hard rock uh, sound to it. Uh, you know, a little bluesier, got some swagger to it. Emmy Lou Harris provides a bunch of backing vocals, most prominently on Sister Moon. She really kind of meshes well, kind of like she did with Gene um, or Graham Parsons on uh, Grievous Angel. Like it's it's almost like she's you know co co headliner on that one. And here the wind pass dresses Sound Crusade. I think are just really good classic Gene Clark, you know, songs. They're it, it's tough because it's like nothing like the first half at all. Like those are very much leaning back towards like White Light and Roadmaster kind of songs. Um, so it is kind of disconcerting the way the album is split up and the way it kind of mines different territory. Uh, so I still have it at four stars. I'm not going above four for this one, but. It's a really good album, I think, once you get past the couple covers that are just, you know, so-so. All right, my next one, I'm going to break the reverse chronological trend. I don't think Gene just got worse as he went along. Uh, I'm going to go back to the first one, his debut solo record after The Birds, Gene Clark with the Gosden Brothers. You got a lot of interesting people on this record. A couple of The Birds appear on it, Hellman, Clark. Uh, you also got Glenn Campbell, Leon Russell, a couple other members of the Wrecking Crew, other big names like Clarence White, Doug Dillard, Van Dyke Parks. Um, it's a pretty cool mix of country, folk, psychedelia, pop. Uh, I think it's pretty birdsy still at this point. Uh, definitely his most birdsy sounding record. Um, the high billing of the Gosden Brothers is odd to me. They didn't have an album out yet. They weren't really a known entity. They would sometimes open for the birds. I think they put out a record on their own after this, I believe. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of weird that, that they get such high billing because I don't think they're that integral to the record, really. They're just background singers. And I, I think they're on all the tracks, but only on a couple do they really make their presence known. Uh, the standouts for me are Echoes, which is really cool track, uh, kind of like Baroque pop, it has this amazing string arrangement that was done by Leon Russell. It sounds great. Uh, the same one, I think, is also really good. That is the track that probably has the most uh, significant contribution from the Gosden Brothers. It's also one of the tracks with Clarence White on it. His playing is great. I don't know. I think it's just a pretty consistent kind of what you would expect a Gene Clark solo record to be after like right after the birds. Um, I don't think any of the tracks on it are as strong as like his standout tracks from the birds when he was with them. Um, so a little disappointing in that sense, but I think it's pretty consistent, uh, pretty solid record all the way through uh, three and a half stars for Gene Clark with Gosden Brothers. All right, that is also my number four. So we are right on track here. Can just go for the trifecta or the duo facta from here on out. We'll see. Uh, I like this one a lot. It is like Jason said, very birdsy. Uh, you got like that hint of country with "Tried So Hard" and "Keep On Pushing." You got some real baroque pop going with "Echoes" and "Say You Lost Your Baby." And, you know, there's also some beatles -y kind of pop and some sort of rock stuff with something like Elevator Operator. And, you know, it, it definitely does feel like in competition with Younger Than Yesterday for me, like both came out the same time and the public went for Younger Than Yesterday. This one kind of got buried. I think that's why they added the Gosden brothers on there because 
I don't know, they didn't have much expectations or something because he was kind of out of the limelight for so long uh, after he quit or was fired or however he left the birds. Um, so, I mean, it's just interesting because he comes with this incredible lineup of just like big name players, uh, Leon Russell and Van Dyke Parks and Chris Hillman and Michael Clark on drums. So he has some of the birds with him. Great um, you know, studio players from the Wrecking Crew, Glenn Campbell, got Vern, the, the Gods and Brothers on backing vocals. He's got um, Doug Dillard on, on banjo on one song. The string arrangements from Leon Russell on Echoes and So You, you Say You Lost Your Baby are amazing, uh, incredible stuff. And yet, I don't know, there's something about it that holds it back from being four and a half. I'm going to keep it at four stars. Maybe it's just because it is like a little unfocused. I could probably cut Elevator Operator off the album and maybe some of the sort of, the just the pop rock stuff. I love when he goes into the country. I love when he does the Baroque stuff. And it obviously points the way forward for him. Um, and I think his songwriting, his lyrics are already really sharp. Like he showed when he was in the birds that he was the best songwriter in the birds. Uh, and echoes, uh, really cool lyrics. Definitely that Bob Dylan influence, uh, kind of bringing that over with him from the birds. Uh, but I don't know, it, it, it just doesn't feel as good as like the bird stuff or like some of the other Baroque uh, pop albums from the same time. So I'm, I'm gonna do four stars. I think there's a lot of good tracks on here and it really kind of shows what he was capable of and the country uh, direction that he would go off in, especially with Dillard and Clark. Uh, but um, as far as just Gene Clark, good album, four stars, but not his best, not quite. All right, my number three is White Light from 1971, produced by Jesse Ed Davis, who was a member of Taj Mahal's band. This record's a lot less ornate than the debut. You don't have the Wrecking Crew on it like you did on the first record. Uh, you've just got like a core band in place for most of the record. You have Jesse Ed Davis uh, on guitar, Chris Etheridge, a couple members of the Steve Miller band uh, backing him up. It's more country, more folk, less Baroque, less psych pop. Uh, for me, the ballads are the strength of the record with Tomorrow and Because of You, I think are both beautiful tracks. Uh, the vocals on Because of You sound so good. And I think it highlights his, his greatest strength. Uh, it really is to like convey real honest emotion without being like extraordinarily performative. None of his vocal delivery ever really feels like he's like putting on emotion. And some of it actually seems like almost deadpan at times. Uh, it's just so straight, but man, when it hits, it hits. There's a fair amount of harmonica on the record. Uh, so I think it's very much his folkiest record. I think the harmonica is never more effective than it is on For a Spanish Guitar. I love the harmonica on that track. I think 1975 is a really great closing track. I do think this record has a, some mixing issues maybe there's there's spots on the record where the bass is really loud and like overwhelming and there's times where like the acoustic guitar seems like overly aggressive where it could use just like a little bit of compression or something to like rein it in a little um so i don't think it's an amazing sounding record overall but i think the songs are really strong i like the mood of it overall i think it captures you know a, a particular mood uh, i think it's very cool in that way so uh, very good record, four stars for White Light. Well, we diverge at last. I'm going to go with Roadmaster as my number three. And it's it's pretty close, I think, between my number three and number two. Really what holds Roadmaster back for me is, I don't know if it's like a real album. Like it's a bunch of different like sessions that kind of got pieced together. She's the kind of girl in one in a hundred were from some stuff he was doing with the birds in 1970. Uh, and then here tonight is um, Flying Burrito Brothers with Gene Clark, uh, with Chris Hillman, Sneaky Pete, Bernie Leiden, uh, Michael Clark. And then tracks four through 11. So you got a, you know, a third of the album 
Then you get into the actual album he was putting together with a bunch of great players. He's got uh, Sneaky Pete on pedal steel. Clarence White plays electric. You got Chris Etheridge and Michael Clark from the Flying Rita Brothers. So it's kind of like being backed by the Flying Rita Brothers in, in a lot of ways. Uh, Byron Berline on fiddle. Supposedly, Roger McGinn and Rick Clark were doing backing vocals, but I guess they got cut out of the, the mix. So it's interesting that he was still like working in with all those players in with the birds because it, it could have been you know they were kind of doing trying to do a comeback or, or whatever with the birds and she's the kind of girl just like super birdsy right off the bat one in a hundred like you get those like really big stretched out harmonies with clark and hillman and crosby and mcginn like all together just like beautiful birdsiness and it, you know, it definitely shows what they could have done if the original birds had gone back together. Of course, they did not, which, you know, that's tough. But he soldiers on here tonight with the Flying Breather Brothers. Sounds great. Love the uh, pedal steel from Sneaky Pete, obviously a luminary in the, in the genre, in the game there. This version of Full Circle Song, which would later appear in a different configuration on the Birds' comeback album, way better here. It is incredible. The vocal harmonies that the Flying Burrito Brothers do here. Um, just immaculate, I love it. Uh, when they do the, the uh, descending ahs in the chorus there. A uh, really great lap steel guitar solo, cool fiddle, just a absolute perfect song basically. I think the album runs into a little trouble in the middle there. Uh, Rough and Rocky's a pretty decent cover of uh, Earl Scruggs song. Uh, Roadmaster kind of got some hokey, like too many double entendres and like sort of weird sexualized lyrics that just really are not like Gene Clark's forte. And I thought it was a cover until about two minutes ago. And apparently it's not. So I guess I have Gene to blame. That's probably his worst written song. I do like his cover. I really don't want to know a lot, though. Uh, turns into this really cool gospel uh, with some big uh, piano on it. And uh, it ends with She Don't Care About Time, which is a reworking of his own song that was a B-side, I think, off of Turn, Turn, Turn. Uh, pretty good. I don't know. It doesn't quite work as well for me as you'd think, though, considering it's like held up to be such a classic song. And uh, Shooting Star is pretty good. Some cool organ early sounding, maybe like Moog uh, or synth on there. So it's a good one. I got a four and a half stars, but it it feels a little bit like an incomplete album. Like, you know, it, because they didn't complete it. They were going to complete the eight tracks, but the label shut down the recording and said no. And then they released this in like the Netherlands or something. So I don't know exactly how um, it all worked out, but when they put it together, like, I mean, this is a really great album. I have it at four and a half stars. Um, but I, I would have loved to see, like, an entire session of, like, the same players and the same sound and what they were working with from, you know, Full Circle Song and The Misty Morning, which is just absolutely gorgeous, uh, on. So, I know, it's another one where, like, the label kind of comes in and ruins everything for everybody. But... Good nonetheless, so four and a half stars for Roadmaster. All right, yeah, Roadmaster is my number two, and I have pretty much the same review as you. And like you said, it's compiled from various sessions. The first three tracks were produced by Jim Dixon, and the rest of the record was produced by uh, Chris Hinshaw. Um, the bulk of the album has Clarence White and Sneaky Pete and Spooner Oldham and Chris Eth Etheridge and Michael Clark on it. I, I like all of the tracks pretty much. Uh, but sonically, like you said, there's a clear distinction distinction between those first three tracks and the rest of the record. And it makes it a little odd. Uh, like, not only are, are there different players and stuff, but the, the overall sound and the sonic quality of the record is completely different after those first three. It just completely shifts. Uh, so it's a little weird. It's weird that they put them all like the first three tracks. Maybe it would have been less noticeable if they were sprinkled throughout. Um, it could have worked a little better, possibly. Uh, but the Hinshaw tracks after those first three songs are, are great. They sound great. They're really warm. I think it sounds a lot better than White Light. 
I think there's great instrumental performances on this record. Uh, Byron Berline on the fiddle and uh, Sneaky Pete on uh, pedal steel on Rough and Rocky are, are both really great. Uh, the whole band really cooking on the title track, uh, especially Clarence White. I think Clark's voice is really warm and full here. It sounds great. I think it's a really strong album, but and I, and I did consider putting this number one because I like a lot of these songs a lot. Like it, it was really, really close and kind of went back and forth with it. But basically for the same reasons that you held it down a little is the same reason I can't really go to number one with it because you got three covers plus a remake of an old bird song. It makes it feel like slightly less of an effort. You've got a full circle song in the misty morning. I remember the railroad. She don't care about time. I think all of that stuff is excellent. Shooting stars. Excellent. But the way that it's put together, it feels like almost like a compilation and uh, yeah, the, with the covers and the remakes. And it's like, ugh, it's just not quite the full album experience that no other is. So I do think it's really good. I think all pretty much all the songs are really good too. Uh, four and a half stars for me on Roadmaster. Okay, well, that's good. Love the four and a half here and that. Makes my day. My number two is going to be White Light. And, you know, this one, I think, has maybe the most consistent sound on, on any of the albums. Like, he's just in folk rock territory here. There's not even that much country coming in here. Um, it's... You know, I hate to say, very Dylan-esque, uh, especially on the Virgin, um, very kind of, you know, counterculture, sort of, you know, be careful what you wish for. And there's a, a real spiritual element on here, uh, which would, I think, carry over into no other. You got White Light and uh, Where My Love Lies Asleep, Tears of Rage, kind of has that little bit of spiritual energy coming in from Bob Dylan and Richard Manuel. It's a great cover there. Um, and I just really like the sound. I love just Gene. His vocals sound amazing. I think his best vocal work uh, on any of his albums. He sounds really clear and crisp and sort of, you know, hurt a little bit as well. You get all that emotion coming through. I think Jesse Ed Davis's guitar, minus maybe a couple production issues that you mentioned, is really good. Um, I really like the sparseness of it. I think it matches really well with what Gene's doing, with Gene's lyrics here. I think uh, just the little touches, like this is basically the opposite of no other, where you have like this all encompassing production style. On this, like you just have a little touch or two of, of organ on Because of You. Uh, you know, some of the songs don't have bass, some of them don't have drums. Uh, so when you do kind of, and it kind of builds up towards the end, uh, once you get to Tears of Rage, you're getting that organ coming in. 1975 is almost like a full-on rocker. You get like real light touch on for a Spanish guitar, that 3-4 waltz time. A beautiful guitar figure that sounds a lot like Bunch Eagle song. So I'm guessing this is an inspiration for anything they did in 3-4 times. Um, and I love the lyrics. I think he's just a, a magnificent lyricist uh, for a Spanish guitar, definitely the peak on here. Even Bob Dylan thought it was a great song. And I love the little harmonica interludes that provide enough texture. There's a lot of acoustic guitar and sparseness on it, but um, you know those little touches really add a lot to it. And um, I think the, the cover of Tears of Rage is fantastic. I think it fits perfectly into the album. It does not sound, you know, it sounds like it could be written by Gene and on this album, which I think is a very big compliment to Gene's lyrics and vocals here. Um, and I just, I just think it's great. I think everything about it is pretty much perfect, but it, it just isn't quite stylistically like no other uh, but this is like the flip side the opposite end of the coin here very sparse very folky but i think he nails it so i'm going five stars for white lights 
Right. Well, we are lining up at the top and Cram will be psyched to know that he has to now figure out what his favorite Gene Clark record is. So yeah, No Other is my number one from 1974. Uh, Gene Clark's standout work on the Birds reunion record uh, convinced Asylum Records to sign him uh, to a solo deal. Then they totally dropped the ball on this record, uh, didn't really promote it at all. Uh, and by 1976, just two years later, it was already out of print. Uh, didn't really receive, you know, proper recognition until uh, a reissue in the early 2000s. There were several reissues before then, but it, it seems like the one from from the early 2000s is when people kind of gave it attention and, and a proper reappraisal. This record was really expensive to make, but it's got a who's who of great session players on it. It also has a much more of like a Laurel Canyon sound, 70s singer-songwriter thing going on on this than any of his other records. Uh, not really that folky, not really country. It's something a little different from the rest of his catalog. It's got the great Leland Sklar on bass, one of my favorite bass players, and his work on this record is really awesome. Some really great bass work all throughout this record. I think especially uh, his playing is not noticeable on uh, Strength of Strings, uh, which is a really cool kind of vaguely psychedelic tune with big fat low end and gorgeous harmonies floating on top. Uh, you've got uh, Timothy B. Schmidt from the Eagles singing high harmony. It just sounds awesome. Uh, you've also got some like long tracks here too. Uh, that song, Str uh, Strength of Strings is six and a half minutes. Some Misunderstanding is eight minutes. Uh, Lady of the North uh, is over six minutes. A bunch of other songs right around the five minute mark. So the musicians here have plenty of room to stretch out. I think it's an awesome album. Uh, in some ways, though, my one complaint, I don't know if it's even a complaint, but one thing about this record, I think Gene almost gets a little lost and becomes like secondary to the sound of the record, which is so awesome. And the players are doing so much um, that I don't know. I found myself at least paying more attention to the players than to the songs. But I think the playing is great and I love listening to the playing and when you do take a second to kind of, you know, refocus on the songs and the lyrics and, and Gene himself, then I, I think the songs are there. They still hold up underneath. Um, so you get both. And like I said, some really great, great songs. I think the, the one song on this record that comes through as a little bit country and a little less like, uh, I don't know, uh, arranged is the true one. I think that one kind of jumps out at you when it when it finally comes along. It comes along at the perfect time. You get this little bit of a break. It's all it's kind of like a little country folk tune uh, at just the right moment when things are you know kind of building to a to a crescendo. Brings it back down. Uh, I think it, it's well sequenced. I think it's a really well sequenced record. Uh, not quite getting to five stars on this though. I'm at four and a half for no other. All right. Well, yes, no other. My favorite Gene Clark album. One of my favorite albums of all time has to be, I've listened to it so many times, and yet I still listen to it, I don't, don't want to say a dozen times in the last week or two, but many times I just cannot get enough of it. I think, but I don't think anything else in the history of music really sounds like this. I think it's the, the distillation of like the cosmic American sound like Graham Parsons was also trying to find and, and do with Flying Frito Brothers and his two solo albums. And I think this kind of is the, you know, the touchdown. This is the cosmic American music that combines country and R&B and all this other stuff into this one just incredible, amazing uh, record for me. And it, it is like the one question I always would have after listening to it like 30 to 40 times, I started to think is like, do I love this album for Gene or is it more Thomas Jefferson K's production and all the great playing? And on one of the reissues, there's like four different versions of every song. And so I listened to every single one and all their variations and the songs underneath are incredible. So I kind of put that idea to bed that Maybe it wasn't, you know, it wasn't Gene, it was everybody else. But I think this, the songs themselves, even in their rough, you know, early stages are all incredibly good. 
Um, Jean does kind of get buried a little bit underneath it all because there's just so much going on and so much stuff. Uh, right off the bat, you know, you do get Jean on Life's Greatest Fool. He's kind of just singing along, Gene like And then the chorus kicks in in this like choir of, you know, country, Western, church, singers, gospel, whatever you want to call it, comes in. And the first time I heard that, I was just like, what is this? This is incredible. All the, the backing vocals on this album are amazing. The bass from Leland Sklar is incredible uh, on pretty much every single track. All the guitar, the pedal steel, the mandolin, the organ, you know, the, there's cello and violin and tons of keyboards. And it all just works so seamlessly into this really cool psychedelic gospel, whatever you want to call it. Gene himself said he was going for a mix of like inner visions and goat's head soup, which is a really cool combination and probably why I like it so much. The song No Other, one for me, song of the year, 1974. It's one of my favorite songs I think I've ever heard. Just doesn't sound like anything else. I believe the legend, and I don't know if this was ever confirmed, but Sly Stone was in the studio and he added, you know, inspired by him, added this like R&B beat and kind of flavor to it. Uh, and the, the cowbell from Joe Lala on that track is just maybe the greatest thing I've ever heard in my whole life. It lasts for like 45 seconds the second time. The first time is like 30 seconds during one of the solos. And it's just, I've never heard it used like that ever for anything. And that's just one of the little things that just completely blew my mind the first time I heard it. Uh, I absolutely love it. Um, Silver Raven's cool. Uh, he said it was about a UFO, but it's got these very terrestrial lyrics to it, which are really cool. He talks about like, the sea and rivers and birds, all this earthy stuff. But apparently he wrote it after a report of like this, somebody in the 70s, found some celestial object that was not of this galaxy or, or whatever. Um, and just a really kind of cool take on a UFO. Uh, Strength of Strings takes a Bob Dylan lyric and turns into this just massive cosmic production. You know, it's straddling rock and country in a way, um, but it's just like six minutes of something that doesn't sound like it's from either side really. Uh, a lot of cool backing vocals. Gene doesn't even start singing for like the first two minutes on it. From a Silver File has a cool George Harrison guitar solo, almost Beatles-y, uh, really cool organ, reminds me of the band. Ed G.C. Davis does some really cool wah guitar on that. You know, every, every I could talk about every song. They're all great. The True One's awesome. Like Jason said, probably the most country um, straight country sounding, but still some really great guitar. Um, and then Lady of the North, which he wrote with Doug Dillard, just uh, psychedelic swirling, just tons of cool wah guitar, dueling with an electric violin at one point, which is just like all these little touches. Like I would never expected that kind of, um, you know, flourish on it, that electric violin that comes in, gives it a real psychedelic spacey feel probably was on a whole lot of drugs when he wrote that one, but totally works. And it's just one of those life-changing albums for me that, uh, you know, the second I heard it, I was listening through, I was just like, please God, don't have any bad tracks on this album. And I was just like waiting for like that one to come in and just like ruin it for me. But it didn't, not, not to me anyway. It's five plus stars, probably in my top, 10 all time at this point. So uh, it was a life changer. No other Gene Clark, my number one. All right. There you go. Gene Clark albums ranked. I don't know if we'll get Kramzer's opinion into this video or not, but keep an eye out for that. Maybe we'll post it on social media or something. Uh, so make sure you follow all of our social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all in the video description. You can also find our website, Patreon, if you're interested in supporting the chan channel in that way and getting some cool perks for it or our merch store. Uh, follow all the links, like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications if you haven't done so yet. 
and tune back in tomorrow for each of our top 10 favorite Gene Clark songs. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.